Thank you, Aubrey, and thank you all for, uh, for your stamina and still being here after a very busy uh, first day. I think that it was very good to have these sessions clustered um, because what we're going to discuss in some ways builds upon what you've been hearing for the past 45 minutes. So we are LongevaQuest. Um, our, our goal here, so that is an example of what we're not doing. We are here to elevate supercentenarian research from anecdotal to actionable. And by actionable, what I mean is for everybody in this room who is working on a biological solution to aging or for public health, um, but also for individuals. Uh, and going into this, we, we know what anecdotal is. We know what the quality of reporting on supercentenarians has been. Um, these are all real headlines from these, uh, for these institutions. So beer a day, cigarettes, and this is one of Britain's oldest people ever. Uh, and this is the line that they take from what he said. Um, you know, the Guardian bacon coffee don't die. And this is really a, a, re a real gem here. Um, cigarette smoking Brazilian man may be world's oldest person at 126 years old from the Washington Post. Um, and so that's something that we were really keen to fix because, you know, there's clickbait, there's meme worthy. And we think that a lot of people are getting the wrong idea about super centenarians. Um, so when we look at our goals. LongevaQuest is not just a research company. We consider ourselves media as well. We want to bring the stories of these folks beyond just stats. We want to bring their stories and help the world get to know them a little bit better. Um, not just the sensationalism, but when we look at our research objectives, a lot of what you've heard for the past few minutes is what we're trying to do as well. One thing I'll clarify, um, you know, there's probably nobody more qualified or experienced than Natalie Coles to discuss this type of work. And with biographical data, a lot of what we mean by that is what she was identifying as personality, as lifestyle, as habits. Um, and so we're going to discuss a little bit of that, some of our early takeaways in a few minutes. But with identifying the world's oldest people, that's a lot of what Vaclav was discussing. We validate um, as well, of course. Um, you know, the first has been very heavily discussed. We're not going to talk too much more about this. Um, you, know, you saw a very similar graph in the last presentation. One thing I'll mention is that we do take the personal identifying information very, very seriously. You see down here this BV for NASDAQ is board vantage. Um, the, the most personal identifying information you see is in the validation process. You saw some examples of it, birth certificates, very personal family records. And so we use the same software that medical review boards, that corporate boards, that bioethics committees use to do that. Um, you know, I'm not a scientist, uh, but I'm also not an amateur, and we're not amateurs. And so we take this very seriously. Um, you know, and if anybody has questions about our validation process, if you go online to longevaquest.com, our methodology section, um, we have this all in a charter. Um, we're very transparent about our peer review process to make sure that the people we are researching and studying are actually super centenarians. Um, and so that's, again, available online. And so we've been working very hard to get a full scope of super centenarians. Um, and what have we learned? We've learned this, um, that living to 110 is a lot more common than we knew about even two years ago. Um, until very recently, it was very difficult. And you saw some examples of why validating super centenarians is hard work to the point where we're really only accelerating things, not as volunteers, but by hiring folks full time in different countries. Uh, it's not just the biomarker data. You know, it's not just asking to draw blood that is very personal. When you ask somebody for their birth certificate, for their grandparents' birth certificate, you know, it makes sense to have somebody from within that country. A lot of our staff is not just local in those countries, but um, they're also descendants of super centenarians. For example, Yumi Yamamoto, our president of, of Japan research, uh, her great-grandmother was Shigeo Nakachi, the second oldest person in Japan at the time, lived to 115, uh, second only to Kane Tanaka, second oldest living of all time. Uh, but somebody who was the grandchild or child of a super centenarian ha knows how to handle that situation, knows how to handle the, the delicate nature of studying people who are fairly vulnerable. Um, and so that really has helped us. And just to kind of talk about some particular ways that this data has gone up, with the United States and with Western Europe, including here, it's been pretty easy to research this kind of stuff for a while, Ancestry.com, et cetera. But when you go to different countries, one reason why we're very interested in staff in different areas is because they have different types of records. So just to give a couple examples, um, we're looking two years ago from this date, so June 13th, 
2022 to now. And these are not just living. Right now, living, just to get, put a number on it, living right now, we have 236 validated living supercentenarians around the world. These numbers refer to living or deceased, but you can see that in Brazil, a gigantic country, 200 million plus population, two years ago, we knew about seven. Now we know about 65. Not gonna set the world on fire, but we're correcting the deficiencies in the global south. Say for Mexico and then Japan. You know, Japan is something that, uh, a country that most folks would say was pretty well represented in these lists, uh, but really not that much because their Koseki system, their system of records is very unique. It takes folks on the ground to interpret that. So we're, we're realizing that Japan, oddly, may have even been underrepresented. Um, and so this expanded data set, you know, India, Philippines never had a supercentenarian, we do now. What we're trying to do is to get useful data from that, um, is everything that you've been hearing for the past 45 minutes. But having a larger, more holistic, quality data set is very important. One thing I want to clarify is that with supercentenarians, now we know this at this point, all of them have lifespans of 110 years or more. One thing that I think we haven't talked about too much is their health spans. And almost all of them last over a century. Let's define this. When we talk about health spans, 95.7% um, of supercentenarians who we have data on were able to stand unassisted at age 100. So we talk about going backwards, that's kind of the start of it, looking at their, you know, their shape at age 100. If somebody's bedridden at 115, I guarantee you they were ballroom dancing at 100 even still, because they're alive at 115. Their health spans last a very long time. And so looking at standing, you know, the 95% number, that's for standing unassisted. 10 years later, it's not so hot. You know, 50.7%, a bare majority can stand either with or without aid. But still, that's pretty good. And it's especially good at 100. And so the point is this, that you, we talk a lot about the science of life extension. And I think that this is a little more broadly relevant. One way or another, we have a population where elder care is going to be our primary concern. Right now, that's demographic trends. We have aging populations. Maybe tomorrow, maybe in 10 years, we hit longevity escape velocity, and then we have a lot of us living a very long time. Uh, and with these supercentenarians, their quality of life lasts a very long time. Think about you know, aging facilities, nursing homes. It's, it's not too common to have folks move in and live there for 30 years. Um, sometimes those things are, you know, those places are seen as almost a punishment. We're putting you to the side. But these folks find ways to enjoy their lives, and we want to learn, um, you know, from them. And what, this is the, uh, typically we don't share data on, on living individuals. You know, this, this lady is very much living. Uh, Ms. Elizabeth Francis there in the center, who is the oldest living person in the United States. And here, here's what's really interesting. So on the right-hand side is her daughter, Dorothy Williams, 95 uh, and on the left-hand side is Ethel Harrison, her granddaughter. And I want you to look at, at her on the left in the glasses because this lady is the most accomplished caregiver in the entire world. And here's what I mean. She was a nurse for 40 years, but these two ladies next to her, her mom and her grandmother, 95 years old, 114, both of them are living at home. And so that, that granddaughter is 70 years old, doesn't look like it, but what we need to do is look at how can we make life easier for her also? We talk about the sandwich generation. Somebody takes care of their parents and their kids. Imagine her, she's taking care of her grandmother and her grandkids. And so we look at this as not being just applicable to supercentenarians, but also to those taking care of them. And that's gonna be very important as there are fewer caregivers in the world because of trends, we need to make people be able to do that easier and better. Um, so I'm gonna share some data samples and this is gonna be from the, what we call the biographical data and lifestyle data and this is, you know, very early, this is barely even scratching the surface, but just real quick to define the population. One, all the people in this data, which is anonymized, are deceased uh, in compliance with ethical guidelines. Um, but when we look at 200 oldest people ever, 100 oldest women ever, 100 oldest men ever, when somebody becomes a supercentenarian, their mortality rate's about 50% year to year. We're looking at the elite of the elite, so to say, when it comes to the Olympians of aging, which is what they are. These are the the gold medalists, um, very much so. But you know, it's not the same group. If you're looking at this saying 200, 100, 100, the 200 is actually 192 women and only eight men. Um, and we look at why, and that's uh, actually right here, um, you know, 200 oldest people. Just look really at the last two. 
This is very similar to the overall life expectancy, isn't it? When you look at the difference between men and women, maybe two or three years, in this case, it's exactly three. But you know, men do live a little bit less than women, both among the general population and among the world's oldest people. Of course, there are some times where it's useful to, to compare gender cohorts. Um, so let's just go ahead, and one more thing to consider real quick is when we look at, the, um, at this population, one thing we should remember is that the average year of birth is 1900. Uh, and one reason for that is a lot of the oldest uh, men in this list were recent, recently validated supercentenarians, people born around 1910, a little bit after, in some cases already deceased, um, but their median year of birth is 1900. So think about that in a few minutes. Uh, and let's just start with alcohol consumption. Um, and, and just one other thing real quick, all these categories, we have response rates of at least 80%. We're taking a lot of information, we don't just get it straight from them, but from media reports, their families, past research projects, we get it anywhere we can. So all these categories are ones that we can, those groups I mentioned, we have at least 80% response. So in this case, the 200 oldest people, alcohol consumption, those headlines that we showed and what a lot of you have seen online, you're probably thinking there's gonna be a high number, but it's not. It's 10.5%. And one reason is because N. Haynes says that moderate wine drinking for religious purposes is an exception. Those people are not drinking to relax. They're not drinking for fun. It's a religious purpose, it might be a small amount, and when we take those folks and their daily glass of wine or weekly glass of wine away, really this is something that you probably expect more when people live that long. Um, let's look at family upbringing, going back a long time, over a century for some of them. Um, for supercentenarians, we look at their childhood as well, and we wanna ask them, we wanna quantify the qualitative, not just have you, did you have a good childhood, we wanna ask some details, and we can get details about this as well from others. So take a look at this. The 200 oldest people, out of all of them, 84.1% grew up to the, at least the age of 10 with both parents in their household. Um, and we're talking about it, you know, I, Natalie made a great point about how not just they were going to war, their fathers would go to war. Um, you know, the life expectancy was much less. There were people who died, you know, their mothers could die giving birth to their siblings. And still, this is a pretty serious situation. You know, so what questions can we ask from this? What resilience are people getting by virtue of having this kind of stable childhood? Um, now let's look at something different, something where we're comparing women versus men, age at first marriage. This is where I want you to please remember the 1900 median year of birth. So when you look at this, this might not really draw too much attention today. Uh, median for women at age 25, first marriage um, for men at age 28. For people on average born in 1900, that is ancient. And that is something that when we look at US census data, both of these numbers are about four years higher than the US census data for about the 1920s, because that's when we're looking at it. You know, 1900 born, 1920s married. Um, so this is something that we look at as very statistically you know, consistent. If we take it not median, but mean, that number goes up higher. Um, let's take a look at number of children real quick. Uh, for the 100 oldest women and 100 oldest men, again, using median um, here, you know, two for women, four for men. Doesn't sound that odd. You know, two and four are both a little bit, well, two especially, a little bit smaller than those numbers were back then demographically. But look at the difference for a second. We heard a little bit today about the you know, theory of aging as an accumulation of damage. Um, one thing that was pointed out to us with this data, what is childbirth doing or pregnancy doing? Is that adding a ton of damage? Is that helping people age faster? Because for some reason, female supercentenarians don't tend to have a lot of children. And that's, again, something that's very statistically evident um, as we look at these things. And one other thing that's very statistically evident, um, this is Lucille Rendon, uh, also known as Sister Andre. She was a nun, uh, very public about her faith. But let's look at spirituality. Um, and this is a number you're not gonna see too much in any studies. Um, out of anyone who comments on it, out of the response rate, so to say, 100% profess spiritual beliefs. And that's, you know, in this case, she's Catholic, but this goes to, to Shintoism in Japan and folks who go to shrines even after the age of 110. It, it's cross-cultural. Um, now, when we look at, once again, the 1900 birth date, religion was more common then than now. It's gone downhill a little bit, but we're also talking about people who have outlived everybody close to them. If they had a spouse, they outlived them. Their parents, many of their children, many of them have had really tough lives. And so when they're being interviewed about this, and every single one unanimously who comments on it is reporting this, that's a very interesting takeaway that we have. 
Um, and so look, stats can really only tell part of this story. Uh, and we really urge all of you to get to know the world's oldest people better. Um, one thing we've done, and been pretty quiet about it, that longevequest.tv is just a, a fancy URL for our YouTube channel, but about an hour and a half of footage, and, and we, we do a lot more because we, we look at these folks as, in some ways, I, I heard Martin O'Day say earlier about, we may not want it enough with longevity and, and life extension. Um, and maybe one reason why there's not that demand collectively is because there aren't so many good examples of people enjoying old age. Um, so we urge you to go and, and look at longevequest.tv to see how they are today and to read about their biographies. These are pretty extraordinary individuals and the stats are one thing, but these people really amaze us. So once again, thank you all. I appreciate you sticking with us and uh, look forward to discussing it more and I look forward to seeing all of you on LongevaQuest when all of you turn 110. So thank you all.